Chapter 1, verse 12 to 26. Now, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of my brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I, I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does this matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will be sufficient courage so that now as always Jesus Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live in Jesus Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you for your progress and your joy in faith, so that through my being with you and again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. series Simply Church, uh, we want to hear what God is saying through his word as we see how the, the early church uh, functioned and made an impact around them uh, no matter the circumstances. And two weeks ago we were reminded by Paul as he spoke to the church in Philippi and last week we looked at the church in Corinth uh, on the subject of generosity and I want to lean back into Philippians chapter 1 again in the, the church of Philippi. Uh, and Paul is using this word, encourage. Uh, he's encouraging the church. It's a word we use. And I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if we use it appropriately. The etymology of this word, encourage, is to put courage in someone. Um, it's what the, that prefix, en, is for, encourage. If I enjoy something, I do something that puts joy in me, right? One of the things that puts joy in me is ice cream. You didn't, re you didn't think I was going to say that, right? We'll talk about that in a second. But it's, it's what, what you do is you put joy in, and it's enjoying or encouraging. And this is what the Apostle Paul was doing in Philippians 1, uh, starting at verse 12. He's encouraging and motivating. Uh, he was seeking to place courage in them from prison, by the way. And we are also going to see Paul's motivation. There's something worth being encouraged by, and it is the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And when you walk out of those doors, are you eager to share the good news? Um, what is our motivation to share the gospel? And I'm confident to say that sometimes we share the gospel out of performance. Uh, I, uh, in, in that way, hoping that God is pleased with us because we had a moment where we shared the gospel. And shouldn't the gospel be shared out of pure joy and worth whatever cost you would have to pay? And, and I have so much joy from the gospel, what God has done in my life, that, I, that I, I, I'm encouraged, I am placing courage uh, in other people by sharing the gospel. And Paul was communicating this simple yet impactful principle to the church as they function in their context. 
Could it be that we are not encouraged to share the gospel because we have been inoculated by Christianity? It's, it's the idea that we have this steady dose of, of Christianity that, that you become immune to it. That we have heard the gospel so much and lived in its benefits so much that we have lost some sense of urgency of the gospel. It's like, I mean, this is flu season, right? And, and who, who got their flu shot already, right? Um, we're not there yet, but, it, you know, it, the, flu, the flu shot, the vaccine, it gives you enough of the flu virus so that your body builds up an Im- immunity to it. And if we are not careful, and the reason for this letter in Philippians, that we can get slow doses of church and the gospel that haven't really changed and reshaped our lives. And I want to unpack this scripture and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us and and really remind us of what Paul was simply saying to the church about the gospel. Paul's courage uh, to share the gospel is infectious. His courage to share the gospel is confident in opposition. His courage to share the gospel is centered in Christ. Now, I've given you right up front, but I'm going to unpack it for a moment. And that, this is a church that Paul started. He's in prison in Rome. He's writing to this church. Ten years la- later, remember a couple of weeks ago, the church started with a small group by Lydia and this now freed demon-possessed girl who was being sold for a profit and this prison guard. And he's writing back to them. And he says this, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. He, he wanted to make it known wherever he was that he loved Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident. Everybody say confident. Say it. You're not confident in saying confident. Say confident. There you go. In the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. And Paul is saying, I am chained to this soldier, which is an opportunity for me to talk about Jesus. Because when you are in prison, people ask you a question, right? Ever been in prison? Don't raise your hand. You know, they ask the question, what are you in for, man? What are you in for? Is it it murder? Is it, you know, what did you do? Is it treason? And Paul, this is Paul, right? No, 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 no. Just sit down because it's it's good. I want to tell you this. What I did was, there was this guy, Jesus... He lived this perfect life, and he died the the, the death I deserved, and was raised from the dead. And one day I was on the path going to Damascus, and he showed up, and he talked to me, and I can't stop talking about him. The guy says, but what what are you in for, though? That's what I'm in for, talking about Jesus. That's what what got got me in here, and that's why God has me in here. Notice how Paul flips this script. This prison isn't a setback. The gospel hasn't changed because his reality changed. The gospel is as true in his pain as it is in his pleasure. As a matter of fact, Paul says, because of my prison, the gospel has advanced even more. The same is true for you today. For you, wherever your context is, whether it's at work or wherever, the same is true for you in your pain. What are you here for? To share the gospel? Do you know the gospel is meant to be told through our own story of pain? And Paul flips this script. People are talking about me in prison, then they are talking about Jesus, and that's good. And one day, the church is afraid to talk about Jesus because they might go to prison, and another day, they see Paul in prison, and they are encouraged. He is placing courage in them. And he's writing this down in a letter. He he is placing courage in them. I'm in this prison because I'm talking about the gospel. And that's why God has me in this season of my life. And Yes, I am in prison, but God has allowed this prison for a purpose. Everybody say purpose. And Paul's courage to share the gospel is infectious. It says, brothers and sisters became confident in the Lord and said, dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear because they were seeing Paul doing it in prison. It's infectious. We take our kids to a a beach with cliffs and ocean every summer in Twillingate. We call it the secret beach. My kids for the longest time thought it was my beach. We called it the secret beach because we didn't think anybody else went there. 
It's, and a, a stream of water rushes in between two cliffs. And I was teaching my youngest to jump off the cliff into the ocean. Don't tell any social workers, okay? You know, cliffs don't seem high looking up, but when you got, get up there, it's another story, right? When you're standing looking down. And he, when we got up to the highest point, he kept moving down the cliff and kept saying, maybe here, Dad. Uh, maybe here, Dad. <laughs> you know, maybe. He kept going down the cliff. And he kept doing that, so I, I went first. I jumped off the highest part and went down into the water and jumped up. Yeah! You know, you know what happens when, when someone does that, right? It encourages and motivates the next person. And within a couple of minutes, he was jumping off the cliff down here, then up here, and then up here, right? Because I did it first. I showed him that it was safe. That's what's happening in this text. Paul is praising God in prison, and the worst thing that happened is just another moment to share the gospel. I saw this at a, our food drive co collection a couple of weeks ago. A team of parents were here serving, and they, they brought their kids. And their kids were collecting food from, food from people, holding up signs. And I noticed that two sets of grandparents drove through with food, and the grandchildren saw their grandparents. And I'm watching this, you know, watching them give food. And the grandparents saw their grandchildren helping. There was hugging and embracing. Why? When something is modeled, it is infectious. It is the heart behind our discipleship path here at Bethesda. We're not just a building. Our mission is this, the mission of this church is to turn those far from God into fully devoted followers of Christ because our building was closed. It doesn't mean anything, does it? In terms of the gospel, we are, we are a discipleship-making church. It's the heart behind our discipleship path. We are producing fully devoted followers of Christ. Follow Christ, grow deeper, give generously, serve others. It's missional living, and, and, send, and we send people out into our city to proclaim Jesus. Disciples of Jesus that are own and run businesses, work in the medical field, classrooms, coffee shops, with confidence. It's the word that Paul uses in verse 14, confident in the Lord. Ever get into a, a debate with someone and you know you're right because you have the correct information? You ever, you know, there's a different way you, you argue when you know you're right. Not when you think you're right, husband, wife, you know? There's a different way you argue when you're confident. It's not a loud or arrogant. Someone will say, how much you want to bet? And you're like, Whatever you want, man. Right? I, I, I got into this debate in college with someone about Labrador who was from Ukraine. <laughs> they were telling me that the coldest it gets in Labrador was minus 15. And I said, no, man. No, no, no. No, it can get as cold as minus 40. No, they said it's minus 15. I know I'm right, they said. No, I'm not posturing up on them. You know, uh, I'm just confidently standing there and said, I'm confident it's minus 40. And it's a calm confidence. And he says to me, well, well, where are you from? I said, Happy Valley, Labrador. <laughs> when you have the truth, no matter the conflict, there is this sense of confidence, right? That's how Paul is sharing this. Watch this now. Through this lens of his confidence, knowing the truth of Christ. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and strife. All right. But others out of goodwill. The latter do, do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. He's like, he's just strife going on outside. I'm here in prison. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not necessarily supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. See, see this confidence? But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every, every way, whether from false motives or, 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 or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Because Paul knows, conf he's confidently knowing the truth. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. How is that for confidence? <sighs> he has the truth. And here's here that confidence. Paul is sitting in prison. He doesn't allow the context to determine his encouragement. 
It's rooted in Jesus no matter the circumstances because Paul is living in the confidence of knowing who's guarding this moment. And he talks about two groups of people. There's this group who is sharing Jesus out of selfish ambition and they follow Paul. He's in prison now and they're kind of mimicking him with, with, with little passion. There's another group who was stirring up trouble. They were out there saying, you know, Paul, Paul said, you guys crucified Jesus, right? Right? That's what he said, man. That's all I'm just, you know, just kind of steering up, you know, steering up this, 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 this uh, trouble. Now, don't miss this. The right motive for communicating the story of Jesus is love. He says, some do it out of love, and I want you to be that group. You can see that Paul's courage isn't just infectious, but his, Paul's courage to share the gospel is confident in, in uncertainty and opposition. And I'll tell you why. Ever, ever PVR... Uh, a show and watch it with someone, but didn't tell them you had already watched it. Every, you don't want to admit that, do you? you? You know how it goes, right? You, you know how it's going to work out, but your wife doesn't? <laughs> I'm just confessing here now. You ever do that? When you're watching it, it's a different experience, right? It's like even watching a, a, you know, one of the, uh, the playoffs or hockey or anything. If you've already watched it you, and you're sitting there watching it again, there's not the same. You've got this sense of confidence. You know, or when the main character gets hurt and, and your wife is like, oh, I hope he doesn't die. And you're like, I'm going to die, man. Right? Because you've already watched it. That's the confidence you see in Paul. In prison, writing this letter to encourage them to share the gospel. He knows the outcome. He hears about these two groups causing strife and he celebrates because Christ is being preached. This text is so often misused. Can, the, can, can I ask a question? Can the message of the cross prevail if the person communicating is somewhat questionable? As Christians, we are always sizing people up. We are, especially the really educated Christians, and they will say, Christian, hey? Oh, what kind? What kind of Christian are you? Speaking tongues? Hmm. Okay. Uh, Reformed? Calvinist? How does God speak today? Come on, 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 on. how does God speak? You know, we, 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 we like have to pick sides. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have character or stay true to have, you know, staying true to our, 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 our biblical truths and things like that. I'm not saying any of that. Or true to the doctrine. But the last time I looked, there is one thing that brings you to Christ. Amen? He died for my sins and God raised him from the dead. And just because you think a little differently than me and look a little different, it doesn't mean we can't lock arms and advance the gospel. Amen? Let's keep preaching Jesus. And yes, it gets messy because we are called to uphold biblical truth. And we will do that when we are in here. We will teach from his eternal word. And you will grow and you, as you lean on him. But as we see the work of God in other places, we will have also applaud and thank God for what he's doing there. Amen? You hear what I'm saying? Are you with me? And Paul is telling us that the gospel grows stronger in opposition because there is a confidence in the truth of Jesus. He's sitting in jail, chained to a guard, and he's telling you and all that it is possible to communicate the gospel in this context. As a, as a matter of fact, the gospel thrives and grows in the middle of opposition. You hear what I'm saying? Don't you dare think that COVID-19 is minimizing the message of the gospel in this church or in this community or in this country or in this world. It, it, it forced us to go online when the building closed and it forced us to go live like right now that we are open. Do you know how many more people are watching our services live and after? Sometimes thousands. Thousands. That should cause you to leap inside, not just because we have grown, but because the message of Jesus is advancing. Amen? God is up to something. And our staff is celebrating it. I'm sure you are. And I'm thanking God for what he's doing. A couple of weeks ago, at the end of a service, two people gave their life to Jesus. Hello? Hello? Hold on now a second. Did you hear... That the five guys, five guys burger joint is opening up in the, in the mall. Yes! <laughs> right? Let me start again. 
Two people gave their life to Christ a couple of weeks ago. There you go. Do you know what? At the worship center, a church across our city, any given Sunday, there are 10 to 20 recovering addicts sitting in their seats. They have given their life to Jesus, and some of them are running the very recovery programs that help them get free. Amen? God is moving, and you get the privilege to be a part of it. Paul is telling us, no matter what is happening right now in this prison, we know that God is going to win. Just listen to this language. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm going on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? See that, that, see that struggle? He, he understands who he is in Christ in this world and after this world. I, I, I win no matter what because Christ is with me. He's conquered everything. And when I'm done with this world, he conquers and I get to live with him. And there's this, 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 this positive struggle going on there. It's so amazing. It says... I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire, we're going to come back to that word, to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in my body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ, Jesus will abound on account of me. Now, that, that's not arrogance. That is an arrogance, what he's saying there. That the gospel is, depends on him. He understands who he is in Christ, his role in this world. And Paul says, live or die. I'm not sure, but it's necessary for me to live, to continue to proclaim the gospel so that you are not inoculated by the gospel. So that something takes root and you're so changed by the gospel that you give your life to the work of Jesus Christ. You go to work every day thinking about that? I am so changed by what Christ has done in me. I'm just, I just want to share it. That word desire in verse 23 is epithemi. It's like an epic desire. It's like desire times 100. It's the deepest longing to be with Jesus, yet this passion to share his love with others. One theologian describes it like this. It's like a ship tied up to the dock that longs to be at the sea, out to sea. The center of this word is the rope is loosening. And he has... He has to be the weirdest prisoner I've, of all time. He's sitting in jail for the third time, and his optimism in the middle of opposition is un, unparalleled. He, he gets thrown in jail while people in jail need to hear about Jesus. He gets beaten. He says, well, it's a privilege to suffer for Christ. They stone him and drag him outside the city. It's okay because I needed to go to the other city anyway. They chain him to a guard. He just begins writing the Bible. They, say, they, they let him live to live as Christ. Let's kill him to die as gain, right? Like, like... This, this optimism in, his, in prison, why? Because Paul's courage to share the gospel is centered on one person, and that is Jesus. He knows who he belongs to. And Jesus goes to the grave and conquers death. He comes out and models this courage in the middle of opposition. Jesus was the ultimate example. The disciples were close to him. They were cowards, and then when they saw the resurrected Lord, they became courageous, and all of them died a martyr's death except for one. Huh. Now you have Paul who met Jesus on the road to Damascus and became the greatest missionary. Something moved him so much that he gave his life for Jesus. Something moved him so much that he could find joy in prison. So now we take an internal audit on ourselves. Why don't we have that same desire? When no matter what happens right now, I understand who I am in Christ. And my desire is to share Christ in prison. In this painful season or the next, with a desire like a boat belonging to, longing to be in the sea. I mean, what do you enjoy the mo most? Me? A lot of things. One of them is ice cream. My in-laws gave me the best gift for my 40th birthday a couple years ago. 
And I came home from work, and when I opened the main door, there was a streamer in the door, and it ran into the house, tracked it down into my basement, and the streamer went up into, this, into our deep freeze. And when I opened it, there was a five-gallon bucket of ice cream. I'm like, heaven can't be any better. I almost cried. What's the best ice cream you've ever had? Come on. What is it? Someone say, say it. It's okay. Vanilla? What, what, what brand? Like, what, what brand? Briars? Ah, oh, Bluebell? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Menchies? So, selfless advertisement. Love it? Different, but love it? DQ, man? All day long, right? All day long, sometimes every day, right? It's terrible. What do you love? What is that thing that desire, that desire times 100? I was sitting at a restaurant a while back, and the server was really friendly, and we got into this conversation about her parents. My kids call me weird for doing this all the time, and it embarrasses them sometimes, which I'm completely fine with, because they told me a long time ago I wasn't cool, so I'm just living in my, in my gifts, right? And, and I was talking to this young girl, and she described to me what her dad was going through. He was struggling through cancer. Don't you dare ever think that God doesn't create God moments in your life. We no longer look for them sometimes. And I said to her, do you believe in God? Oh, I'm not really into that, you know, pushing religion on people. And this is when we are afraid to share our faith because of those moments, right? We're afraid, ah, oh, if that happens, you know? What do, you, what, do we, what do we say when someone rejects your faith? And I said to her, hey, you know what? I don't either. I don't, I, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with pushing. I don't, but I just found the best ice cream around. <laughs> and I love introducing him to you, to people. My life is changed, and I just want you to know that I'm praying for you. See, when we enjoy our relationship with Jesus, we enjoy talking about him. Hear me? And Paul's passion, as I am, to be with Jesus and his passion to share Jesus in jail is the key to enjoying his relationship with Jesus. Let me say it again. Paul's passion to be with Jesus and his passion to share Jesus in jail in this season is the key to enjoying his relationship with Jesus. It's understanding that I am secure when this life is over. I am secure even when I am in prison because my joy is not found in circumstances. It is in who? Centered on Christ. He has gone before me. He has conquered sin and death, and I live in that joy. The joy found in Jesus should translate into loving others with this epithemy, this desire, like a ship desiring for the open sea. A scene in London, as I am, captured the world's attention. As someone was taking a stroll, they could see a guy on the other side of the Golders Green Bridge. He was about to take his own life. And a crowd began to gather. And what makes this story so memorable is what happened when people began to gather. Someone captured it with this picture. Next slide. And what happened was one person grabbed him and another person grabbed him. And someone got ropes and tied it around him and onto, on, onto the bridge and they held him for two hours. Two hours. You know why? They knew there was something better for him. They didn't stop to ask him what he believed in or his theological stance or where he stood or how he looked or what type of person he was. The courage for one person to stand there and hug him and then another and another and another is what Paul is doing in Philippians 1. He is going first. You don't have to be afraid, Paul is saying, I want to put courage, I want to place courage in you to share Jesus without reservation, no matter the circumstances and center Christ at the center of your life. You see, Paul's desire for Christ was simply out of the fact that he met him on a road. Jesus changed his life, and that doesn't change because his circumstances changed. Paul's desire to share courage with the church was out of that reality. Would you stand with me, all of this room? Let me end with a question for you. As we, before we sing, as we internalize God's word today, how 
infectious is your faith? How infectious is your faith? Is it contagious enough that others boast in Christ on account of you? Let me say it again. How infectious is your faith in Christ? Is it contagious enough that others boast in Christ on account of you? Regardless of your circumstances, you're making Christ known. And Paul is writing to the church and he's sharing the gospel his, his courage is infectious. His courage is confident in opposition. And at the center of his courage com- is, is, is Christ. Where do you stand? As your pastor, in the, in the middle of a very unsettling circumstances of COVID-19, we sometimes want to default our faith because of our circumstances. And Paul's saying, no, no, no. No, I'm in prison. His faith was infectious. His courage is confident in the middle of uncertainty because even though this changes, God doesn't change. And at the center of that is Christ. And when we know who we are in Christ, it places us more of a subtleness in our hearts in the middle of uncertainty because he strengthens us in the moment and he goes before us. So how infectious is your faith? Is it contagious enough that others boast in Christ on account of you? Let's, let's pray together. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We just want to hear from you today. We want you to speak past the noise. The obvious noise of what this new reality has caused us. It's actually not even a new reality anymore. It's just, it's our reality. And what is done in our own hearts. And the uncertainty that's caused in our own lives. We are tempted to kind of default our faith and our passion to advance your gospel in this world of uncertainty. But as we look at Paul today, we're reminded that circumstance doesn't change, doesn't change our posture in sharing faith. As a matter of fact, in the middle of opposition, the church in Philippi and Paul is telling us that they've the gospel is even more advanced because our lives are centered. Their lives were centered on you, Father, which never changes, even though other things do. And I pray today for that person in the room as the Holy Spirit was speaking to them about their context and their strong faith or weak faith. I pray for that person today who is even questioning their faith because they have allowed circumstances to overshadow who they are in you. I pray that for that person that has no faith. They don't even know what it means to have contagious or infectious faith. They don't have any faith. All those people today, I pray that you would speak into their lives strength and maybe new faith. And maybe you're in this room today or you are watching and you feel something in your heart as even in this moment as God is speaking to you and you've never taken that moment of faith. You've never stepped out to accept God as your Savior. You, you know about God. You've heard about God. You may even read the Bible at some point. But you've been kind of tuning in for the last couple of months to this church and we're so thankful for that. But maybe you want to make that step of faith. It's very simple. As we are in the middle of this, this series called Simply Church, it is simple. It is confessing in your heart and believing that Jesus Christ is Lord. Confessing your sin. Because the only thing that separates you from God is your sin. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us, myself included. It's, ex- it's confessing your sin with your mouth. Lord, forgive me. Can repeat this right now. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. 
Be the Lord of my life. Say it. Be the Lord of my life. I accept you. I believe in you. Walk with me, Lord, as my Savior of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, it is...